All right, now we're going to talk about tools of recovery. I promise we'll come back to this. Now, this is kind of like on the backside of the boundaries and the rituals and all this, because I, I believe that these tools for recovery will work. They'll work if you use them. You know, recovery is not just going to some meeting somewhere in the basement of some church or community building and sitting there warming a chair and listening to everybody talk. You use the tools to, to change who you are. It changes how you show up. It, it impacts your shame. It, it impacts every element of you to where you learn not just to stay sober. If that's all you're doing, then this program is not, I'm not designing this program for this. I'm designing this program for you to be a person who learns to show up with other people in your life. You learn to be okay with vulnerability. You learn it's okay to be authentic. You can be you in process, imperfections and all. Now, there's no guarantees and it's very uncertain and I'm not going to spend a lot of time there now. These tools are for the purpose of you learning to get to the show up place and be authentic and real. Now, not just to stop some behavior or some abuse of some substance. You got that? All right, let's look at some of the tools. Now, I'm going to tell you, gentlemen, and ladies and gentlemen, that you got to do it in community. This business of people saying, I just, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm gonna, well, good luck. I, I don't know many that have ever made it in, out of any kind of abuse or any kind of addiction alone. I think that God has designed us in such a way that we're to heal in community. Many of us were wounded in some kind of community anyway. So I think the healing takes place, the corrective experience takes place in community. I think that's the way we're designed. We're designed to be more social than all an island to ourselves. Now, I admit there's some of us that are more introverted than others. I am. I'm a very introverted person, actually. <laughs> I get recharged at home. I get recharged when I'm with my wife. I like being home. I'm a very much of a homebody. And so when I'm out in public, it burns energy. Now, I get that. I understand that. But I still needed to go to meetings. I still needed to be in community. Now, today, my community is much smaller. I have a small group of, of men in my life that I'm accountable to, that we check in, that I stay real with. I don't think that ever changes. It's church to me. Sometimes I go to church and I enjoy the corporate worship, but that's, that's, not the, I don't, that's, too, big, that's too big for me. I'm too introverted. Community for me in the church that I like, you know, outside of the big walls of the big building, is that small group of people that we pray together and we share together and we, we walk life together and, and trusting God in our journey. Now that's, that's a whole nother level for me. And it all comes, I, I learned that through this community of my 12-step community. Now, there's the SAs, there's the AAs, SAAAs, the SLAAs, for those who have sexual addiction, there is AA, there is Al-Anon, there is NA, there is SA, uh, I already said that. Um, they, there are other 12-step programs out there available towards it. Then there's also the faith-based groups. There's the life groups, the Celebrate Recovery groups, and Christians and Recovery groups out there that are for a number of different uh, substances and behaviors that people are trying to recover from. You choose what you would feel most comfortable with. I, I felt very comfortable doing Al-Anon. I did it for years. Uh, it works for me. I, I, it's my community. It's my home base. Uh, I'm not pushing it. It just worked for me. That's, what I'm gonna say. That's all I'm going to say about that. But get into a community and begin your healing process. Now, you're going to need a sponsor. You're going to find a sponsor in these groups. And that sponsor is somebody that goes before you that's worked the steps. I know in my group, nobody could sponsor until you had been sponsored through all 12 steps. And it, I don't see how in the world anybody can do the steps properly under a year. It takes at least that much. You know, you just have to work them. And so that sponsor is someone who kind of leads the way. And that sponsor, and you work out how you want that done. Certain sponsors have styles. Uh, I just needed occasional nudge and, and connection. I didn't need somebody to hold my hand. I was hungry. I wanted it. So, I mean, I kept running off and doing it, and I called him, and he never initiated a call with me, by the way. He always responded to calls from me. He said to me early on, he said, Eli, he says, I've worked my program. I won't work yours. You have to work it. You call me, I'll answer, and if I'm not in town or if I'm not available, I'll call you back, and we'll meet. 
There were sometimes we had meetings. We were, we were on the same with stairmasters beside each other at the Y. <laughs> and we had our meeting right there. And it was like, you know, but it was what I needed. And he somehow knew that. I picked him out because that man had something I desperately wanted and knew I didn't have. When you go to your meetings, that's where you're going to find the sponsors. As you begin to notice them around the room, at the, usually at the end of 12-step meetings, they'll give an opportunity and invite anybody willing to be a temporary sponsor, raise your hands. They raise their hands, and then if you note one, you say, okay, I have a connection with that person, I want it. Well, I did with my sponsor. When I knew when he raised his hand, whatever that man had, I wanted. And that's who I wanted my sponsor. So the night he raised his hand, I was the first one across that room for him. If anybody got in my way, I'd have knocked him over because I, I wanted whatever he had. That's your sponsor. And they walk you through your steps. They walk you through your programs. They give you a lot of insight and help. Now, you got the 12 steps. Now, some of the faith-based groups out there alter the 12 steps, and they've changed the lingo, but they're still in there. I think you need to kind of, it's not just going to meetings. You've got to sit down and read the material. You've got to answer the questions and talk them through with your sponsor as you work through those steps. And generally, like I said, with, with any of your 12-step groups, you know, they're hammering on those steps each month. You know, suppose that it's like that, you know, we're talking June. Well, they're going through the sixth step. If you're talking about August, they'll be going through the eighth step. Now, you may not be there, but they're educating you each month on that step. So wherever you go in any meeting, 12-step meeting that is, they're going to be covering that step. You'll know what that meeting's done. Working the steps, reading the materials, and going through the questions is really important to give you the insight and the background you need to keep walking sober. Now, for some of you, there's the internet. Those who struggle with certain process addictions, they struggle with sexual addiction and so forth, you're going to need internet accountability. You know, put the computer in a place where it's a high traffic. Put it in the middle of the living room. Put it where you can't get off privately and look on it. Put, a, put some computer software on there that monitors or, or filters what you watch or look at. Keep things tight for yourself so that you can do this. Now, also read recovery material. You know, stay up with your materials. So read your daily devotionals. You know, uh, every program has a certain number of devotionals to read. I'm not going to sit here and list them right now, but they're out there. You can ask your sponsor, what is some good reading and some literature? They will give it. My sponsor handed me a book, Courage to Change. I began there, and as I went, went along, he kept encouraging me to get different books. I did. And so as I worked my 12 steps and did my counseling, he gave me other literature to read that really helped ground in and, and solidify my recovery process. Stay on the phone. Make your calls regularly. You know, I often challenge the guys that I work with on an individual basis myself is that I want you to call on somebody every day. I don't care if you're having the greatest day in the world. Make a call. Bottom line, what you're doing with this is that you're training your monkey to do this every single day. I will be a person who stays in connection with others. Now, shame grows in secrecy. Shame grows in silence. And shame grows in judgment. <laughs> Brene Brown. Now, the point here is this. As you're making these calls on a regular basis every day, you're calling non-shaming, non-judging people. And you're staying connected. You're staying current. There's no secrets. There's no silence. You're breaking that. And if you will do this and find, you know, and you're calling guys that are in recovery, you're going to find that over time, you know, these guys know. They've been there. If you're calling some other woman or man that's in your recovery group, that's, I would recommend staying in same-sex type of conversations like this. But you're going to get encouragement of somebody who knows what it's like to walk out your journey. They're going to provide empathy, not sympathy. And empathy is a real killer to shame. And shame, we know, drives addictions. So make the calls. Make them every day. When you do that, every single day, then what happens is when you're in trouble, the first thing you're going to do is, is pick up your phone. Put in your guys. I had guys in my group that were in my speed dial. And I just went down the list, and I hit one, and I hit two, and I hit three, and I hit four, until I finally got somebody that was available. Do it. Sometimes I've had guys that had me either at four or, or ten, and they said, you're the tenth call. I said, well, great, I'm glad you got me. I've got time, let's talk. You know, stay persistent. Now, the other one is that we talk about the intervention of cravings. You know, when you start having cravings, 
It could be that you're in a pre-trigger state. It could be that you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, bored, or stressed out. And those cravings hit the roof. One thing is, talk about it. Get on the phone and tell somebody. Go take it out of the dark and into the light. We find that it takes power away. It alleviates anxiety as you begin to plan with somebody that says, well, this is what I do. In other words, get the long view. Have somebody remind you, listen, thanks for the call. There's a meeting tonight at such and such. I'll meet you there. Go. Let's go do that. And then mobilize. One of the things we find today is that there's such a link between the mind and its obsession or preoccupation about something and getting up and just moving. If you're stuck at a desk, get up and walk to the bathroom. Get up and walk down the hall and get you a glass of water. Um, if you're at home, get up and move the other end of the house. We find, research shows us actually, that if you'll get up and move, that obsessive thought will, will dissipate and the trap door will open back up. If you'll do some of these things early on, quick, and have your plan in place and do it, you'll find that when the cravings come, you can alleviate them. You can open up the trap door again and just by movement, getting up and walking around your desk, anything like this will help you get out of that, that preoccupation and you can stay sober. The next one is self-care. This has been one of my harder things is to allow myself to go fly fishing. Well, I live in a, a great place for fly fishing. Some, it's a wonderful place. I love to fly fish. To, to get myself out there, to take myself fly fishing is a recovery principle. Maybe it's going to see a doctor in my regular doctor's appointments. Maybe it's just going out and spending time with friends, doing something fun, healthy, safe. That's recovery too. There are times where I've called some of my recovery buds and we've gone out and uh, we played golf together or we would, we would go do something or hike. Something that was for us, it was enjoyment. That's recovery. It's also self-care that we do these things. And so I make myself, my wife holds me accountable sometimes and says, you haven't been real good to yourself lately. Well, I, you know, and so that's a recovery issue for me that I keep, I keep trying to, I have to be accountable for. Now, counseling. Now, here's a counselor that's been to a counselor. I would never trade that for anything in this world. I think counseling, if you can find a good counselor that knows how to help you with what you're struggling with, go. You know, it, it's worth the money. In the long run, it's worth the money. If you keep using if you don't deal with your trauma, if you don't deal with your conflict, divorce is very expensive. Uh, it, your, de your disease, your addiction is tremendously costly. Not only because of what you spend on doing it, or you spend on getting out of the problems you have, but the time that you spend doing it and you're not doing something productive. So there's stuff out here that you've been designed to do and accomplish, and if you keep staying in your trauma, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get, get and stay sober. Now, there is several websites I recommend for those who are struggling with sexual addiction, is www.sexhelp.com, a list of certified sexual addiction therapists, and there's the www.sash.net. It's a list of clinical members of the Society for Advancement of Sexual Health. They are, that's a resource. You can go to AA. You can look in your yellow pages for any of those who do, do drug and alcohol. You can look for certifications around drug and alcohol and other addictions. Go to somebody who knows what they're doing. Go, go for medical help. Some of you have not taken good care of yourselves. You've thrown yourself onto the bus, so to speak, and you've not, have you been checked? Those of you who have certain, you know, alcohol or drugs, I mean, are you doing damage to your body? Those of you who have sexual addiction, are you, are you carrying some disease or do you know you're disease-free? How clean are you right now? Go get medical help. Go find out how you are, just a regular checkup. Most addicts are really bad about taking care of themselves. And spirituality, I, I don't know, I'm not pushing anything particular, any particular denomination. I don't know that you can make this without a higher power. As a matter of fact, for me, God used recovery in my life to really kind of revamp my, all my theology. He kind of first reduced me down, told me what I didn't know, and then began to give me the simplicity of the gospel. However it is for you, and whatever it is, you're going to have to have a spiritual connection with a higher power. I recommend that you spend some time here, get some help, a spiritual director, a priest, a pastor, a minister, a chaplain, somebody that would walk you through this and help you in the healing process. Most of us who are addictions and co-addictions, 
you know, or in relationship with addicted addicts, we, we have a struggle here. And there's healing that needs to take place here. And so I recommend that you get the help you need to get through this. And we all need community. We cannot do this alone. Doing it alone is not good. You need to be a part of a community. Get in a recovery community. And then I want to talk about real quick on slips. Nobody's perfect. There are times where we do have slips and we do certain things. A slip is a short lapse in progress. You know, keep working it, keep coming back. I mean, I've known guys that struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled, and finally, whatever happened that day, they finally got their last white chip and they moved on. And they got the 30-day chip, and then they got the six month, and they got the year, and then they got the 10 year. It doesn't matter how many white chips you end up collecting. Just keep coming back, keep working at it. If you're continuing to have slips, my recommendation is you got to do some work around your trauma. There are some unhealed wounds there that need to be fixed because you keep medicating, you keep going back, and you're medicating the pain. Get help with that pain. Now, recovery works if you work it. If you'll notice, I've not promoted sitting in a seat. I've not promoted a particular meeting to go to. It's using all the tools. It's working on the whole human. It's learning to show up at the show up place with safe people first learning what it's like for maybe the first time in your life to be authentic and to be okay with that and recognize that you're in process, that it's not about perfection. And like it's said in every group meeting I've ever been in is keep working because it works if you do. Keep coming back. That is my recommendation to you. If you use the tools and you work it, you'll find the authentic you. Thank you.